Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. Uh, we are going to get started here in just one second. I um, just want to let everyone to get on. We're going to have Dan Powers and Josh. And Josh, what's your last name? I'm sorry. I'm Stagall. Stagall from IBM. And they're going to be walking through Windows 10 and the number one preventer of ransomware. Uh, but I just want to give everyone a chance to get on. Just do a little housekeeping here on your go to my webinar client. There's a section in there that says questions. So if you have questions along the way, uh, please type them in there. We will get to them at the end of the presentation uh, and we will answer all the questions that are in there. Uh, also, we are recording uh, this webinar. So anyone that registered for the webinar will get a link. So if you want to pass it around inside your company, and you'll also get a copy of the presentation that Dan and Josh are doing today. So just want to let you know those things. So with that, uh, and we also have just three quick poll questions. Uh, so, uh, but I'm going to let Josh kick this off and then we'll go through the poll questions and then we'll have Dan start the presentation. So Josh, if you don't mind kicking it off for us. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Um, so first off, I want to thank everyone for joining uh, the call today. Uh, my name is Josh Stigall. I'm the worldwide or global channels leader for uh, endpoint network security at IBM, which includes the uh, Big Fix uh, product line that IBM acquired about seven years ago. Um, so I'm really excited to be here with uh, Champion. They're one of our, our top partners for Big Fix um, in uh, North America. I'm going to really going above and beyond from a partner perspective and developing a solution and a toolkit to help organizations uh, migrate um, to Windows 10. So I think we're all pretty familiar with what's been going on from a ransomware and just general malware perspective this year um, in, in some of the big companies and organizations that have been impacted um, you know, by the malware and also the global spread of things like WannaCry and, and Petya. Um, you know, we see uh, endpoint hygiene, you know, things like patching uh, as a key um, activity um, and then a key thing to do to prevent ransomware and malware, but also migrating to Windows 10, which is the most secure version of Windows that's been released yet, um, is a really uh, a key goal for organizations to help prevent things like this from happening in the future, right, and really securing your business uh, you know, for the for the rest of the decade and then moving into 2020. So again, I'm really excited to be here with uh, Champion. Uh, I, I can't say enough about Champion and also specifically uh, about Dan Powers. He's probably one of the most knowledgeable um, people on uh, on Big Fix and endpoint security in, in general um, that we work with. So on that note, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to uh, Dan. Um, Dan, take it away. I appreciate that, Josh. Uh, welcome to everybody today, and we appreciate you spending your time with us. As we had mentioned, we are going to jump into Windows 10, um, and, and one of the reasons I'd say it's one of the number one preventers of, of ransomware in 2017. So a little bit about myself. I do work at Champion Solutions Group. I do various security tools. One of them happens to be Big Fix and some other tools. We've really worked quite a bit over this past year and a little bit uh, of 2016, all around Windows 10. And what we've noticed is this is starting to explode for various reasons. And we wanted to share some of our tips, comments, suggestions, because we know most of you out there are either engaged in a Windows 10 project or will be. Um, and actually, with that, Kevin, can, can we had a couple poll questions, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes, we probably do. should get those out of the way first. Okay. Our first question that's going to pop on your screen is, have you moved to Windows 10? And real quick, yes, no, or, or you're in the process of doing it. If you just could quickly press one of those for us. Well, believe it or not, 54% of you, 56% of you are in process, 27 have already gone, and 16% of you haven't, and that's at 75% of you voting. So I am going to close that poll, and we'll go to our next question. Next question is, how many users do you have? And you'll be able to see the different sized users. 
and there you go. So um, 1 to 250, 250 to 500, and so on down the line. About 70% of you, now 75% of you. Okay, and I'm going to close that poll. And our last question is, um, if you plan to move, what is your time frame for moving? So and I'll launch that right now for you. Um, for those of you that already moved, which was you know, a pretty good percentage, uh, obviously this isn't a question for you. All right, it looks like almost 20% of you are at 18 uh, months or plus. And, and I know that Dan, you're gonna cover some of that in your presentation about the end of life of Windows 7. So uh, I'm sure that might change after, after this. So I'm gonna close that poll, turn it back over to Dan, and Dan, you can start the uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Kevin, for that. So again, we're talking to, and appreciate everybody for being interactive with us and, and answering some of those questions. We do try to release that, put it on our website. Uh, and again, it's all about sharing here is why we do it. So for those of you, a good, good lead in to there, Kevin, for the whole idea of Windows, uh, Windows 7, right, and people that are looking at when they're going to start. So we will talk about that. Uh, but of course, we want to talk about Windows 10 a little bit, Windows 10 for business explicitly. Why is this such a really cool operating system from Microsoft? They really are changing not only the operating system itself, how it's delivered to you, and all the different features that are on that and everything that we talk about from a better integration to Office 365, Azure Active Directory capabilities to do that, that offers some security features as well as as well as maintenance in this new cloud computing type of environment we're all in. Uh, Cortana is something that wasn't around before. We have uh, the IoT, right, everybody's heard of that. Uh, IoT devices are going to start being enabled everywhere. A lot more different devices running a Windows platform, if you will. But we only have X amount of time here to talk about today. And really what I wanted to concentrate a little bit more on is the whole safer and more secure side of Windows 10. These things like device guard, Windows information protection, credential guard, and so forth, because that relates to the topic that we picked and what we're seeing as trends. And again, from our perspective of dealing with the clients that we have had and the different discussions we've had over this past year, we had quite a few clients that were pushing Windows 10 off a little bit. They looked at that end date as being way down the road and they thought, oh, we'll do this through attrition. We'll do this at a later date. So for some of you that are on there and answered, oh, we'll look at this in 18 months or, or you know, a year and a half from now is basically what that means, is you may rethink about that. If you have a handful of devices, not such a, a big deal, but when you start talking a thousand, tens of thousands of devices, there's a lot that goes into this. And one of the lessons I learned as being an engineer who really looks at the how, the bits, the bytes, and so forth, is the business impact. And, and hopefully some of that will come across today, and these are lessons learned from our side. But if, if we go look at, you know, trends in 2017, and I know everybody's familiar with ransomware, right? We all heard the WannaCry, we heard the PETA, the various variants to each one of these. these. These are some of the big ones that hit in 2017, all the way going back to CryptoLocker, you know, a few years back that ran. This is a new technique that the hackers are using out there instead of just trying to infiltrate your environment, steal data, exfiltrate it out they found it just much easier to issue these ransomware techniques and just kind of locking you down and holding your data for ransom, even to the point where this is kind of big business, right? I don't think I need to tell anybody that, but you can go into the dark web, you can rent websites, and you can do ransomware as a service. It's, it's, it's a huge uh, business out there today. And this, I think, is one of the driving reasons that we have had clients come back to us rethinking their idea of, well, maybe we really should look at Windows 10, right? We really should take a look at our endpoints because as a security company, we deal with a lot of tools, right? IBM being a great partner for a lot of those tools, Palo Alto Firewalls, Microsoft, all these different tools that help protect your environment. But at the end of the day, 
it really is that endpoint. And as the more we have those internet uh, IoT devices, the more we are of social media, the more everybody's enabled on the internet, I no longer have that idea of just putting a firewall and a perimeter network in place and protecting myself. It just doesn't really exist. I need to strengthen myself from all over the place. And a couple of the key things of these attacks that happened in 2017, we did get calls from different clients that we had because it, it first take, took effect over the over the pond, if you will. So, so the, the U.S. here, we had a little warning. Uh, and we jumped into some of their environments, used the different tools that they had. I know Judge had mentioned Big Fix. We are a Big Fix consultant firm. Uh, we have a lot of clients that run Big Fix. We ran in there, made some reports, tried to find their devices that were possibly could be affected by these outbreaks when they happened. And of course, what we notice is, is Windows 10 was not. Uh, that is because even though some of these things are very sophisticated how they get to your machine they're sophisticated how they deliver themselves how they actually spread is more basic they really take into consideration vulnerabilities built into the older Windows operating system and Microsoft to their great credit with Windows 10 kind of changed a little bit Windows had always been an operating system that they try to make easy to use you can plug it in at home it will talk to the internet you can talk to another computer and they kind of Turning that around and really focusing on Windows 10 for business, which is a little more locked down. Now, for those of you that have been in the progress of implementing Windows 10 or did implement Windows 10, um, I'm hoping that you did it in the proper way. Um, and you're enabling some of these features that Windows 10 does offer, which we're going to get to in a minute. Now, before I do that, I do want to take one step back and just look at some of the top attacks you're likely to face and, and different ways that you can guard yourself against it. Again, uh, this is not just Windows 10, this is just what has been out there this year. And quite honestly, again, we get engaged all the time to put in very complex solutions. Uh, I'm not saying you don't need them, you really do need them depending on your organization. But if we go back and look at 2017 and say, how were these things delivered? How did breaches happen? And the number one thing was socially engineered malware. What is the easiest ways that you can get around this or help present, uh, prevent your company from being impacted by this is user education and awareness and I, and I can't stress that enough we can put all the bells and whistles in place we can really lock down systems but you always reach that point where my, my users need to be proactive they need to be able to do things to do their job um, their education around what is a spam email what should they click on or maybe not click on will go a long way in preventing these malware outbreaks that have happened. Now, sp specifically from Windows 10 standpoint, what they've added into Windows 10 Defender, the advanced threat protection, again, implemented properly can go a long way to stop some of these uh, socially engineered malware. Number two is phishing of passwords. So again, this is the idea where they have false websites, they might send you an email you click on, and they're tricking you into giving up some of your user data, your username and password that they're hopefully going to use later. So again, how can I prevent against this is implementing some type of two-factor authentication. Because even if I know your password, but I don't have biometrics, I don't have your fingerprint or your uh, ID scan or RSA token or something such as that, I'm not really getting anywhere by just having your password. So again, you're protecting yourself. Again, Windows 10 offers a lot more compatibility and versatility to natively support some of these two-factor authentication mechanisms all the way down to those endpoints. The third one, and, and hopefully this is not a surprise to anybody, it's poor hygiene. Uh, basically, it's just poor hygiene where people are not patching their devices. Even in the case of WannaCry, if you really look at that, Microsoft had released months before that a patch that totally would have stopped WannaCry in its tracks. Those that got affected by it simply had poor patching hygiene. So you really need a tool in place that can help you assess your environment in a real-time nature, can show you where your vulnerabilities are, and not only that, but you can start patching your systems, whether they're on your network or they're off your network because we realize that our border, if you will, is no longer at that firewall. It's people working at Starbucks. It's people working at home. It's just a mobile computing workforce today is what it is. So you need to patch. 
We do a lot of work around patching as well with various tools. And just a quick tidbit out of there, I know a lot of people struggle, may not have enough resources, whatever the case may be, and they very much struggle to patch all of their systems 100%. Uh, what I look at is if you know where some of these attack vectors come from, and I'm not trying to pick on any software or anything, but we know they're going to be PDFs. It could be Flash. It might be embedded macros in Excel. These type of things, if, if even if you only reach 80% patching compliancy, but you take care of those things first and do them very well, you will be better off than going crazy trying to be 100% patch compliant. So that's just something that you should work into your SLAs and a goal to me that you should sh set for yourself. Uh, number four, social media. Again, we're in an environment today where everything is out on the web. That's Facebook. That's LinkedIn. Uh, uh, for those of us that have more of a professional social media is the LinkedIn world. I love my brother's quote. Um, you know, w before you're going to uh, take a picture and post it somewhere, make believe that you're doing this at a de deposition. It's going to be out there. Your information that you put out there, everybody can get to it and see it. So be careful what you're doing in this scenario on social media. The other idea that you want to do from a business perspective is if all possible, separate work from the personal side. Sometimes you can't do that. Like I said, LinkedIn to me is one. It's more of a professional uh, social media where you do use your business uh, email account, but certainly don't use the same password you do on any social media as you would use to maybe get into your VPN or to access your email at work. This also comes back to that user education, right? Provide that for your employees. Help them understand what is and isn't acceptable. Help them understand the business impact they could have when doing uh, social media out there in the world. And then lastly is, uh, again, number five, rounding this out at 2017, was the advanced persistent threats. So you could picture that, and some of you may have had it, where you have antivirus, you have anti-malware, you have intrusion detection systems. You do get... Uh, breached, you do maybe get infected, you do whatever you can to clean it up, you reboot some systems, and then you notice a few days later that, well, they're infected again. How did that happen? This is where that legacy BIOS, the master boot record, this is where those root kits can hide. So anti-malware, antivirus can only do so much in these cases, and this is where we found that where those things hide. From a Windows 10 perspective, and what Microsoft is putting in there is moving to UEFI and enable secure booting. So UEFI is not a Microsoft thing. It's not a Windows 10 thing. It's a standard that is moving away from BIOS, which hopefully everybody on the phone realizes what that is. And that BIOS technology really hasn't changed since the 80s. UEFI has been out for a number of years. If there's a bunch of Mac fans out here on the call today, you've certainly seen that uh, Macintosh has been using that since 2006. Linux has adopted it. The various uh, uh, Unix flavors have as well. Microsoft really tried to do this in Windows 8.1 and Windows 8 didn't quite take off. But all of those other cool features that, that secure booting, device guard, credential guard, and so forth that you may be familiar with, if you do not enable UEFI with TPM and so forth properly, you're not as secure as you think you are just by moving to Windows 10. So my point there is just doing in-place upgrades to Windows 10, just installing Windows 10, while I still think would be better probably than what you have out there today, is not stopping this malware attacks that we're seeing, and we know it's simply going to keep growing. So that's really the point of this. And that leads me to the last uh, section here is I'm going to come back to this poor hygiene, this poor patching. So whether I'm socially engineered, whether I get a phishing attack, social media, or whatever it is, I may get attacked. But the impact to the business, the impact to what happens to how far this spreads and what the impact overall will be is going to come down to how well have I patched my systems, how well did I patch my applications, because these malwares can't spread to the effect that they have literally crippling businesses 
if they implemented proper hygiene and patch their systems. So again, I'm going to come back to number three. Um, I know number one was the number one delivery uh, of the malware and the number one way to get breached, but to me three is probably as important, if not more than that, that you just need to make sure you can keep your systems up to date, whether they're on your network or off. So again, just what we notice out there in the environment today. So I, I went through some of that and I came back to why companies are moving to Windows 10. We've done a few of these webinars. If you attended one before, you've probably seen this screen or very similar to one we've had. The reason I brought it back up um, is exactly these security issues we've been seeing. So of course, at the bottom, you know, what are the reasons people are moving to Windows 10? Well, let's face it, it's inevitable. Uh, there is that closing date of 2020. It's going to be end of life. If you have a couple hundred machines, that could seem like a long way off and you're probably right. If you have a thousand, tens of thousands of machines, the 2020, that road just got a lot shorter. And I wanted to share a little bit some of the issues that we've had with our various clients in moving to Windows 10 and what are some of the considerations you need to think about and how long it will take to get there. And as I had mentioned, we've had customers that I may have talked to six months ago, eight months ago that were putting this off, but because of these wanna cries and petias and various things of this year that came out, uh, they're getting a little bit of pressure to make sure they're as secure as possible. And they've come back to us to re talk about the whole Windows 10 at the endpoint and that brings up that uh, section that I highlighted there in orange. It's just you really do want to leverage Windows 10. Again, most people have Windows in their environment. That is the predominant desktop down there at the end user. You really want to make sure that you do it properly. So what does that mean? It means defining a desired state for you. Uh, Everybody can have a slightly different desired state, but at the end of the day, there's three components there that I think should have to be. You want to move to Windows 10. Uh, you want to move to 64-bit operating system. A lot of people did in-place upgrades back from XP to Windows 7, which was just fine. Most of the applications were still 32-bit, some 64, but you could still get by. Moving forward, you want to make sure your systems are 64-bit the application, the vendors, they're all starting to come out with 64-bit apps. They will stop doing 32-bit apps. Of course, I can't run a 64-bit app on a 32-bit OS. If you're going down this route, make sure you put that into your consideration. And lastly, like I mentioned, a lot of people that we talk to have heard about secure booting, uh, anti-malware drivers, all of those cool things that Windows 10 gives you. They failed to realize some of the requirements of that, which was UEFI enablement and TPM. So I'm going to bring that back up just to make sure as you're considering this that that this is on your radar. It's part of your project plans. And those of you that already did the migration, uh, I, I hope that these are the things that you did consider as well and these are in place in your environment. So with that, what did, what did Champion do? What are some of the things we've worked out with our customers and we're trying to share here today? Um, is we really realized we really needed to understand the environment. So if you have anything more than a, a handful of endpoints, you really need to get data collected from these machines and you need to create, again, what I had called that desired state. Where do I want to be with my devices? That's the only way that I can say, okay, I gathered this data, here's the spot I'm at, I know where I want to go, how do I get there? I can only do this with the data points that I collected. And I'm going to bring up some of the ones uh, of data points that are required, and to me, some of the ones that help us make decisions. At the end of the day, if you make that move into Windows 10, there's a lot of things that you want to do. You need to evaluate your entire environment from a hardware perspective to make sure that they can leverage Windows 10, that they're compatible with Windows 10, and even maybe if the vendor has certified drivers to it. BIOS is something that a lot of people might not have considered. It is a recommendation by Microsoft. It is a recommendation by all of the vendors that you update to the latest BIOS prior to moving to Windows 10. In our experience, obviously, it's usually not something that's on people's radar is to keep their BIOS up to date. 
we built a little automation around that to help facilitate that and to flag machines that may have very old BIOS. Reason again that that is important is you want to make sure that the BIOS firmware is up to date so that you successfully can enable UEFI TPM at the right level and take advantage of all these uh, things inside of Windows 10. Uh, we also started collecting warranty information. So for large organizations, we've had customers that have come to us and said, okay, here's, here's the requirements to move to Windows 10. Anything on our hardware that isn't compatible, we're just going to uh, order new hardware. That, that'll be it. We'll put Windows 10 on it and we'll roll out. As you start collecting this data, some of these decisions are, are affected. Why is that? They didn't quite have the budget to replace thousands of pieces of hardware. Uh, even their idea of doing it through attrition over a few years, because of these security concerns, no longer were applicable. So we started gathering warranty information on every endpoint. It was important because if we could pull back why a machine wasn't able to move to Windows 10, maybe we just had to order some more memory, but this machine has three years left of its hardware life cycle. It made more sense to order memory, put that memory in place, move this machine to Windows 10, than it did to A, junk the machine, get a new one, or wait to do this through the attrition process. Of course, we want to check your applications. We'll get into that a little bit. Uh, once your machine is ready, you really then can determine, can I do an in-place upgrade, which is kind of like patching your Windows 8 box and moving it to Windows 10. Uh, it's quicker, it's faster, user state stays intact, the application stay intact, the user gets back to work. We'll talk a little bit about pros and cons and what we learned there. And if you can't do that, if it's a 32-bit operating system, if it's running under BIOS and not UEFI, there's some fundamental changes I have to make and I can't do that in place upgrade. We have to kind of wipe that machine. Doing this from a manual standpoint would be very cost uh, in, uh, prohibitive and also again that road of 2020 it would take a long time to do so we've we've been able to automate this through various tools and that's what we're trying to share with you today so after we do that we have to load our Windows 10 we have to put that user state back in place we have to deploy back the software that was on the machine so I move that into two different sections one is your base software that's what everybody gets the Microsoft Office Outlook Skype or link whatever your choice is there and then there's the additional or optional software the software that an accountant person gets versus maybe what an IT or salesperson get how do you automate that? Those are some of the things that we were able to do here. And then placing these machines back into the domain and making them back active for your users. With our customers, depending on network and all these other little factors, we could do this over lunchtime. And we could literally move people successfully into Windows 10 uh, over their lunch break, which, which made, obviously, it much faster to do. We didn't have to do it on weekends or at night. And we were able to achieve our goals much, much quicker. So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit. Uh, so our methodology that we've used, hopefully I've probably beat the dead horse here, but on current, uncover what your current Windows environment is. Uh, I know where I want to go. I, I define my desired state, but I don't know where I'm starting from. I can't get there. So that's just something that needs to be done. We need to ensure your application compatibility. So I will talk about that a little bit more later, what we did, because in most companies we go to, if you have thousands of endpoints, we're going to discover thousands of titles of software because we're going to have multiple versions of Adobe, multiple versions of Office, Java, all of these things. What tools, what methodology, uh, method can we walk through to help you slim down what you have to look at as far as compatibility there. Design and test your Windows 10 image. So this is not rocket science here. You're going to come up with what your image is. Now I will share that I am a fan of thin imaging. Um, not creating images, here's an image for IT, here's an image for sales, here's an image for these folks. Because to me, it's just like a car. As soon as I buy it and drive it off the, the, the lot, uh, it's depreciated. As soon as you do that with a Windows 10 image that has every application and VPN software and anti-malware and all these things in it, you are going to make changes over the life cycle. You are going to make changes to your environment. Having to go back and re 
embed these images uh, into your MDT or, or your different servers, how you're deploying it, is difficult to do. Creating thin images for your environment and being able to have a workflow and tool that can manipulate and update things afterwards is a much uh, more flexible way to go in my opinion. And of course, when we do things, we do a POC in the environment, a proof of concept. If you're doing this on your own, you're obviously going to target a test group, a target set of users, maybe in a lab, and then maybe going out to more of those IT people or people that you trust can give you good feedback before you open this up uh, to the mass public. Uh, the last part here is deployment and mentoring. This is when you're really turning on Windows 10 adoption. You're really letting this flow. A lot of companies will do this in different ways, uh, which we'll be happy to, to talk about. But I also want to get into the mentoring side of it. In our experience, we noticed communication was key. Making sure your end users know what's coming. Making sure they know what to expect. And with that, if you could also provide them maybe some training, uh, whether that's online or not, about Windows 10, moving a lot of those end users from what they're comfortable with, whether that's Windows 8, Windows 7, and moving them into that Windows 10 interface uh, can be a little daunting. And what we're trying to avoid here is having that flood of help desk calls back into you because you're doing this. So if we go forward here, I, I, I kind of threw together a quick update here of something that we look at, right? So again, I talked about knowing what your environment is today. You really need to have that idea, be able to get that data from a hardware software uh, compatibility, finding out which machines are compatible and which ones are not. Those ones that are not compatible, having the details, not shown on the screen, but why it's not compatible. We started also adding, as I had mentioned, that warranty information. Uh, this became incredibly important in the decision-making process of do we just replace this hardware? Do we do it through attrition or do we maybe order a piece of hardware, whether that's a memory, a video card, or whatever it might be, because there's a lot of life left on this. So I, as an engineer, I was more, always more concerned of how do I move the bits around and how do I get this done? Engaging with a lot of customers really kind of opened my eyes a little bit that this is a business impact. The business is really what is driving this. These decisions are really back at your business. Do they have the budget for this today? Uh, warranty information that we started pulling in and providing for our customers was probably one of the biggest things that the business got excited about. So again, just something to consider is don't just put your engineer hat on. I'm assuming most of the people on the phone today are those engineers that are responsible for Windows 10 or network admins is consider the business, consider the impact to your line of business as you're going through this. Overall, you'll have a much more successful project. Windows real-time data. So again, compatibility. This is an example of what we need to look at. We need to understand in my entire environment, can I keep this graph, can I keep this data up to date with those devices on or off the network? Which ones need to be replaced, which is that little one over there in blue. I'm sure you probably can't read that. And over here is our wipe and replace. So what are the difference between these? This is my section of machines that are capable of running Windows 10, by the way, I should probably have said this, when we start this, when we start this assessment and this analysis, we use as a starting point right off Microsoft website that says, here's how much memory, disk space, video card, CPU, and so forth you need to support Windows 10. You obviously can adjust those, which we have for various clients, um, based on their requirements. Maybe it's more memory, disk space, whatever the case may be. Uh, those are the considerations to put in place, but that's what drives this chart. The difference between that orange and light orange number is machines that can achieve my desired state without wiping the hard drive, meaning I can do an in-place upgrade. And again, we'll talk about this more, but it is faster, but I'm going to show you the, plus, uh, the pluses and, and cons with this scenario. This is where warranty became something very important, again, from a business side of the house, but I recognize that now that we really did need to consider the business impact of our project going forward, not just the engineering feats that we're trying to put in place, is gathering some of that warranty because that will affect the decisions of how and when the migration to Windows 10 will be. And the complexity as well. Uh, we've 
obviously noted, and this probably should go you know, without saying, but if you're in an environment, maybe you have a single vendor, we're all Dell, we're all Lenovo, we're all Surface Pro, or we have a very small mix, your success rate of moving to Windows 10, being supported, being able to reach that desired state with UEFI, and if you're implementing the secure boot and the device guard and these things, will be easier for you than in an environment where I am supporting multiple vendors and multiple models and again it will come back to that point of your BIOS making sure the BIOS is updated making sure I can make that switch to UEFI I can enable all the proper features to take advantage of the Windows 10 security because remember I know I keep talking about just moving to Windows 10 but in my mind it's already in grade it's my Windows 10 desired state it's not just moving to Windows 10 it's achieving the security level I need to help reach the business uh, need of preventing that malware outbreaks, right? That is your goal. That is your desired state. Keep that in mind when we're talking here. A couple other things that we did notice uh, when we first started this, I really thought, okay, well, how long is it going to take to migrate 5,000 users over to this desired state? Shouldn't be a big deal. We know which machines we can in place upgrade. We got a whole set here we know we have to do a wiping and restore on. We started getting into and looking at the users who are actually moving. What are they? What's out there? When I first thought of this, I thought the average user space, that user profile, right, his documents, his sticky notes, what browser history, all those things I need to capture and restore would be fairly small. I really did. I thought it would be a few gigs in size on average. However, having done this for multiple clients and, and, and multiple clients in different industries, by the way, um, from healthcare to automotive to um, uh, IT and so forth, is this was way low of a number. Really what we found is the very small is under three gigs. Uh, the average size of a user state profile out there was just under 10 gigs of size. This again will affect how long is this process going to take, right? Because I have to copy that and restore it back into place. And of course we get into those outliers that are just well above and beyond that number. This particular chart did come from a real client of ours, and if you notice, 20% of their environment was well over 10 gigabytes in space. Uh, the winner so far is 1.3 terabytes of size. Um, it's an interesting data point, and this is where, again, we're going back to that business and providing some insight into the business, and even from an IT perspective, is many of the clients we did this for went back and looked and said well why are, what is out there why are why is this data so big um, and unfortunately in some of those we found backup of databases we found patient data we found all sorts of things that quite honestly should not have been on those endpoints so it's a very interesting data point to have how this related to our, our Windows 10 uh, side of the house is to me is twofold a is was just showing the complexity and time it was going to achieve uh, take to achieve our goal whether that's an internal you know milestone that you have set to be done by 2019 or of course to obviously be done before the end of date of Windows 7 uh, the good and I guess bad side of that is when we did go down some of these data points, as example this one, we did find some violations in the environment from a security perspective, right? Uh, so that led to some other other uh, sub projects, but understanding what data is out there and cleaning up the unnecessary. Why waste it if it's out there? Uh, I am coming back to the applications. As I had mentioned previously, there are going to be a lot of applications in your environment. You do want to grab those different applications, get a listing of them. Again, this is a real graph from a client of ours. Uh, I forget how many endpoints they had, but the raw data was just over 2,000 applications. So if we looked at this and said, okay, now I got to go through 2,000 applications and figure out what works on Windows 10 and what doesn't, this could be a pretty big undertaking. What we're finding obviously is quite consistent out there is we found multiple copies of Adobe, multiple copies of Java and Chrome and Firefox and all of these things. So we started going through a process of saying, okay, at the end of the day, and we move people over to Windows 10, uh, we want everybody to be more standardized. Why? Let's go back to that slide too where I said patching, right? Keep yourself secure. Make sure you patch your systems, your applications. If I have an environment where I have everybody on the you know closest OS and the 
talk about Windows here, so I'll say Windows 10, and I can keep their applications pretty much close together. They all have, you know, Office. They all have the same version of Office, and I can patch this. I am in a better position from a security standpoint and being able to manage my environment much better than if I have 10,000 devices and 20 versions of Office and Outlook and Adobe and Java and all these things. It's difficult to keep up with. So what we decide is the end of the day, if you've had Office on your machine, once we moved you over to Windows 10, we were going to make sure you had 64-bit version of Office. You might have had 32-bit before because your operating system was 32-bit. And we're going to make sure we standardize everybody on the same versions. Now, inevitably, you may have exceptions to that, and that's fine. You will run into areas of, well, you know, with this application, we need to be on Java 1.5. It's just where we're stuck at. That's great. It's an outlier. We can identify that and maybe even move something like that into a Citrix environment, if you will. But trying to standardize on your applications and versions is going to give you a better supported and easier cost of ownership of your endpoint devices. And going forward, well after this Windows 10 adoption and migration has taken place, a much cleaner, healthier environment that is going to also put you in a better position to help keep you secure. So real quick, just hit closing out the application side of it. Again, these are real world examples. We were able to identify duplicates in this case because we kind of just threw those out. We knew we were moving to these versions of the apps at the end of the day once we identified them. We really got down to where we had 64 applications, not 2,000, 64 applications that we need to validate and test ran under Windows 10 platform. Much easier to deal with. We're able to deal with that much, much uh, quicker and easier. That's what we ran out to. Again, just taking a tip of done, having done this multiple times, this will save you a lot of time if you could put that stake in the ground. Now, this is going to affect, by the way, our decision coming up here in the middle, in a minute, whether I do an in-place upgrade or wipe. So keep some of these things in mind as I talk about it. Uh, rounding it out. BIOS information, I'm going to throw this back out there. Most people don't consider this. To reach my desired state, to be UEFI secured and all these good things, you're probably going to need to update some of the BIOSes in your environment. If you have a new set of hardware, they're probably going to be just fine. Anything in the last year or two would probably be just fine. But if you have devices out there, they're capable of running Windows 10, they're a few years old, you are probably going to have to update their BIOS. Make sure you could do that. Again, our point here is to become as secure as possible, but we want to do that in the most efficient, automated way to save you time and money. Uh, go back to the warranty side. This is just going to affect uh, the business side of it and the decisions you make here from what you're going to replace or not. And lastly, over here, you see my little chart. Uh, again, real world example. We're in an environment. Uh, it started at 5% UEFI. Those just happened to be the new machines they bought that year. Everything else was mostly in BIOS mode. As we started running along through the Windows 10 adoption, we just saw that pie chart get bigger and bigger to UEFI, really where we wanted to be, so we could position them to take advantage of secure booting and those other things. So providing those real reports into the uh, user side. Um, this chart is one of our workflows. This is very wordy. I'm not going to go through this. I'm going to slim this down into something that's much easier to understand. I'm getting a timing warning, so I'm going to move a little quicker here. So all those things I talked about, that's gathering that data, right? That's gathering the data. Is a device compatible or not? If it's not, I need to be able to tell me why it's not compatible. Warranty information, having all that data, I can make decisions on what to do with it. If it is compatible, I got a decision next. Um, if my desired state is, hey, I don't know if I'm going to do secure boot and all these things, but I know I want to be 64-bit, I want to have UEFI on, so I can enable that at a later date, and I have a Windows 8 box that's 64-bit, it's booting UFI, I can do an in-place upgrade. It's going to be faster, easier, uh, you can get on with the next person. Uh, we'll come back to that in a minute, but a majority of your devices, I'm going to guess, are 32-bit, maybe in BIOS mode, and really to get to your state, I got to go through a migration process. I got to change some hardware on this box and, and wipe its hard drive. To do that, we kick off our process, which here's begins the automation. Here's begins come of that savings to get you to that goal quicker, is we start with capturing our user state. Once we're done with that, we go through a process of 
forcing this machine to boot off the network to our imaging system. He checks to see if he's UEFI enabled. If he not, he makes that switch. That's something that, uh, again, Champion developed to put into the, uh, the, the Pixie boot system to do that. Forces it to reboot again. The machine has to do it from a hardware reason. Passes our UFI check. We're, we're getting on our way to reach a desired state. Here's where we can do the rest of our workflow. For example, enabling secure booting. Just as a tip, we try to do this inside our Windows PE environment. Depending on the complexity of your vendors and, and, and models, we had too many issues here to make this work consistency, uh, consistent. We found it easier to do this after we loaded Windows 10, which we certainly could have done. Uh, we get to go back and put down the base software. We got to get this user back to work. We're going to put that office and outlook and all those good things. The additional software, how did we do this from an automated standpoint? Well, with our tool, since we're gathering all sorts of data before we put it through this process, we also gathered what software it had on it before. We simply call back to our reporting server, pull that data based off the serial number of this machine, and we start putting back that additional extra software. If you had SAP on you before, I'm going to put SAP back on you. It's just going to be the newest version at the newest uh, release. I'm going to restore my user state, and again, I hit my final stage, which certainly could be things like we add them to Active Directory, we we do all sorts of other cleanup mechanisms, and we turn them over to being complete. We reach this green circle just like we did the run-in-place upgrade. So now I'm going to come back real quick to this run-in-place upgrade versus this path. This obviously took me a little longer. Again, I can do this over lunch in most environments. This one was faster. However, what is the end of the day difference? They're both 64-bit Windows 10. They're both in UEFI mode, but if you notice, well, I didn't force this guy through secure boot. Okay, I can do that after if I needed to. That's fine. Um, but all the base software, additional software. He may have Office 2016 on him. It may not match all my other endpoints here. So again, these are the decisions that you're going to have to make. Does it make sense to force machines through this process? Because at the end of the day, they're simply going to be more consistent. So hopefully that made sense to you. Uh, Again, just reiterating how do we get that applications, how do we validate they run, and how do we deliver them back to the endpoint. At the end of the day, all we're simply doing is because our toolkit grabs an inventory of the apps, we call back utilizing its serial number. It's the only thing that hasn't changed once we re-image the box. We can get the list of our applications to put back into place. Uh, Again, putting my business hat on, being able to deliver this data in real time to the line of business that you're reporting back to, understanding where exactly am I in my environment as opposed to incompatible devices and why, which ones can be in place upgraded or wiped, and also while you're running this process. Are you meeting your SLAs? Can I report back to the business where the endpoints are? How fast are we actually doing this automation process? So these are some of the lessons that we learned as far as being a, a good partner to the business and being able to report back to them. So at this point, I'm going to play a quick video. Uh, obviously, I can't do a demo. This is about two minutes long, and it kind of just shows you that the process. And once we kick it off, um, it Oops, excuse me. Once we kick it off, this is a, a no-touch environment. So we start with the picture that I just had on a minute ago, and I'm just kind of showing you, you know, based on that stuff that we talked about, how easy is it to look at an environment uh, that has more than a handful of endpoints and find machines that are compatible, not compatible, the reason why they might not be compatible, and then kicking off an actual automation workflow that'll bring that device into my desired state. So again, follow along this video, we're looking at all the devices that are not compatible. We're finding out why. Simply be an insufficient video card. Again, maybe I'm just going to replace that video card. This guy will be good. Somebody with lack of disk space. Could just be a cleanup or adding disk space to it. But here we can be able to very quickly find all the machines that are compatible. What we're simply showing you here is it's passing 
all of our che checks, whether it's compatible or not, which again, we start with Microsoft's recommendation for a minimum of running Windows 10, which obviously can be adjusted. We do provide a lot of set of reports, uh, again, being able to suggest that to those folks that are going to go down this path. The line of business is going to want some of this from you. Being able to understand exactly where you are at any given point of the project is going to be key. And of course, even as you present into, hey, here's the machine that are incompatible we may have to budget for these do those line of business have the budget to do it how are you going to handle those incompatible machines uh, here we're going to show you this is the cool part this is we're actually kicking off automation uh, again as I had mentioned it starts by capturing the user state so we're going to go in here find a compatible device I picked one of the test boxes and we're actually going to kick off a capture user state and we're going to watch that machine actually go through switching to UEFI reloading windows redoing everything putting them back to production I of course had to cut the video because just laying down the Windows 10 image took about 20 minutes so uh, also you have various options some of folks do this at night, some doing it on the weekend, um, some doing it during the day. Now, if your user could be busy, he's trying to get his last email out, write a report. You can give them the flexibility to postpone this action for a certain period of time or have them just take, take the action now and opt in and go to lunch and hopefully when he comes back, it's all done. A couple of things that we did here, what you're seeing is a, a uh, we manipulate the screen, the background screen, there's a lot of little things we do. This lets the end user know what's going on, so if you're doing this remotely and I'm imaging somebody a state away and a bunch of them, it's giving them an idea what's going on. We successfully capture the image, we force this machine to do the pixie booting, it starts loading the Windows PE environment. You should see a pop-up here What we injected. Hopefully it shows up. Um, oh, there we go. Hey, look, we, we, we know we're on a Microsoft model. We're going to run the MS switcher. We notice you're booted in BIOS. We're going to switch you to UEFI. We're enabling UEF, UEFI, and we have to enable that force booting again. That machine does it. Here's where I cut the video. Now it's actually passed my test, and it's laying down. Uh, the Windows 10 image that we put in place, the machine comes back up on our network and re-enters our workflow uh, because I still have control of it. Here's where we're showing the end user. At this point, we know you're a newly imaged machine. We're putting the base software back in. Here's an example where we went out based on serial number and we're now installing the optional software that should be put back into place on this system. Of course, we have to put the user state back into place. I know where I copied it to. I'm simply restoring it in this part of it. The last stage is what we just call final. You obviously can change what you do here, but we remove the screen savers. Uh, we do some cleanup work. We join it to the domain. We rename the endpoint, uh, honestly, sometimes back to the name it was before, or we might rename it if a, a naming change uh, was required for whatever reason. So we do all sorts of things at the end, and at the end of the day, we have our Windows 10 uh, system deployed. We have it as a 64-bit operating system. And I think I cut this off here, but if you scroll down, we would notice that it is booting in UEFI mode and that it was secure booted. So I achieved my desired state. I hardened this endpoint a little bit uh, in my environment, and we can do it in an automated fashion that's going to bring us to the point of being a little more protected down at that endpoint layer. So some of the things you need to consider, right? Uh, when you made your move from XP, you know, how long did it take? What was the business impact on there? Was it automated? Was it expensive? Some of the new things to understand with the Windows 10 rollout is that 32-bit, 64-bit. Didn't matter that much uh, when you move from XP to Windows 7. It certainly does now. Applications are 64-bit enabled. You really want to make sure your operating systems are 64-bit. But the biggest thing I can say here is UEFI. So I know we talked about device guard and secure booting and some of those other great features in Windows 10 that's going to make you more secure and help prevent some of that malware. Um, if you don't have time to walk through all that testing today, at least make sure you're in a position to enable it at some point. That means just making that switch to UEFI is paramount, okay? Um, and understand that in-place upgrades, again, just education, not everybody, but some of our customers, we're going to simply try to do in-place upgrades. I can't do a 32-bit to 64-bit switch, and obviously if I'm booting BIOS today, I can't make that UEFI switch by simply doing an in-place upgrade make sure you add these things into consideration and what the impact is on your business.
Um, so at the end of the day, right, how are we going to better prevent against malware? Windows 10 is great at this. There's a lot of security features that the operating system offers, but you need to be able to put your in a position to take advantage of them. And the biggest thing that I, I'm going to say here, and I probably said it a hundred times, is enabling that UEFI piece. I, we've had clients that have started their rollout into Windows 10, were doing in-place upgrades, their environment was still booting uh, BIOS, they went back to enable some of these security features and realized they couldn't do it. So you really want to divine, uh, excuse me, defined what is that desired state. I want it to be UEFI enabled. We can deal with some of those other security things at a later date. 64-bit operating systems, but this allows me to now have the ability to enable secure booting, credential guard, device guard. The other things to start thinking about is encryption. BitLocker, which is always a good tool, under Windows 10 offers BitLocker to go, offers a better management. You have the MBAM server. All of these things are going to put you in a better position to prevent malware because it's simply going to be on a rise and make sure that you're in a position to help your environment harden itself. So I urge you folks, and again, I know I talked a lot here, urge you folks to look at uh, next steps. Check out our website. Uh, give us a call for some questions and help, and we will be available as I take a break from talking uh, to see if there's any questions out there. Thank you, Dan, and and uh, yeah, we do have a couple of questions here. Um, first of all, uh, Pierre asks, can we switch to UEFI without reinstalling Windows 10? Uh, that's an excellent question. So if you asked me last year, I was going to say no. Um, and I had a slide in some of the other desks that show you is the layout of the hard drive. So the layout of the hard drive in the old side of it is uh, you have that MBR master boot record, BIOS comes up, hits the MBR, that then loads the bootloader, the bootloader then, you know, if you don't have multiple OSs, would load the Windows operating systems and, and let it go. Uh, there was no way to switch that, right? The, it, the hard drive had to be reformatted. Microsoft does have a tool now, and there were some other people that put it out which was not supported by Microsoft that allowed you to manipulate uh, that that, that uh, uh, drive, if you will. Um, I've used a Microsoft tool, and it does let you do it. The problem is that there, there's no way to automate it, right? Or I haven't found a way to automate it. So now you're back into a manual process of doing this. Now, if you ask me, hey, I, I went down my process. I've, I've installed Windows 10 on hundreds of machines. I really don't want to re-image them. I would agree with you. Um, you probably can use, and it's out of the... Um, uh, might escape with the anniversary edition of Windows 10, what is that, 1703, uh, the toolkit out of there, and I think it's called MBR to, U, to, U, to GDP uh, is, is the name, MBR Master Boot Record GDP is the new format of it. Uh, you should be able to get some success there. It's not going to be an automated way to do it. However, also remember you're going to have to go manipulate your BIOS. Um, and, and probably update your BIOS and so forth. So you should be able to do that if, if you've already deployed Windows 10 in your environment. Unfortunately, uh, I don't think you can automate it at this point. Okay. Um, and I got Jonathan asking a question. You, it's, uh, let me just see how he, what he says here. Um, you said that you can look at all the applications that are installed on the PCs. Two things, what operating systems do you support and is this agent or agentless to collect that data? Uh, okay, so excellent, excellent question. So, so first of all, we support all the operating systems. We're talking about Windows here, so obviously I don't need to say Mac or Linux. <laughs> uh, so, so all the uh, Windows operating systems, uh, again, we developed the methodology and toolkit. When you look at this and some of the examples I use, given the time we have, right, I had to pick one. Uh, we did use Big Fix. Uh, we use that for a couple reasons. Um, again, I know it very well. Um, it was the tool that was the most flexible to us, that gave us the most flexibility to inject new things into it. Uh, again, as I had said, the BIOS, the different data there, how to add that to a workflow, the warranty, and I can go on. Um, it's, but it does support all versions of Windows and even POS uh, embedded Windows systems. So that's what we use. Some of those example screenshots you had that, uh, that I put up here in today's presentation was data out of Big Fix. Um, and again, we get that. A lot of it's out of the box. A lot of it is custom content that we here at Champion determined, hey, we need this data. Let's go get it. Okay. 
And the last question I have right now is from Carolyn, and it says, this sounds great for physical PCs. Can you do anything with VDI? Uh, you, you can here as well. Uh, some of the issues there, of course, is, to be honest with you, is, is that Eufy, um, and that's really where uh, the device guard under Windows 10 is going to help you extremely well. Um, from a VDI standpoint, so it kind of, if, if you ever heard of containers, um, it's going to help you from that point to make sure that your different VM systems and the credentials going back and forth and moving are very credentialized, uh, containerized, excuse me. Um, but you can do it. Some of the issues there, which I guess is very similar to the hardware side, right? Because we're dealing with BIOS. How old is the BIOS? Does it support UEFI? This is going to go back to what you're running from your virtual environment, uh, you know, the vSphere, VMware, and so forth, and what version that is, and does it support the UEFI booting, right? So yes, you can do it. Um, it's just a different, you know, you, you are moving my mind from that physical side over to the V. VDI side, and it really comes down to the the hosting system uh, that is going to be able to boot these systems up afterwards. Because by default, they want to do it in BIOS mode. Well, Dan, that that's all I have for you right now. Uh, I, you know, I, I think the they asked some pretty good questions here at the end. Do you have any um, last comments before we we stop the webinar? I, I think we're – thank you, Kevin. We hit 3 o'clock perfectly. Um, I appreciate everybody here. Again, I, I, we really try to do this as an educational standpoint and really just sharing our knowledge uh, and, and our experience. So I hope – I appreciate everybody being here. I hope you got something out of it. And if you do have comments or so forth, uh, we'd be happy to hear from you. And, and even to those folks that already moved to, to Windows 10, love to hear about what your issues were and so forth. We do try to create content on our website and blogs. And what we're trying to do is help the other guys that have answered the question that said, hey, we're going to be doing this in the 18, next 18 months. Um, let's all help each other out here. Great. Thanks, everyone, for joining today, and have a great day.